These are revelations always to show Where the truth unfolds and the facts will flow Mysteries, secrets, stories untold These are revelations worth more than gold and welcome to another installment of Lisa Marie's Revelations. This is a show where we cover every chapter of her book with Riley from here to the great unknown. We're not, well, I don't read it word for word. Um, I give you all of her revelations. I don't read any of Riley's stuff, but I give you guys the tidbits of what is in her book so you guys can understand her life, her revelations, what she's revealing to us as a person. And so far, it's been a lot. We are on chapter three of the book, and this chapter is called The Wall. It's a very, um, it's not quite as sad as he's gone, but it is um, very, very troubling and discerning and makes me very angry this chapter because of what happens to Lisa Marie and that it shows that her mother did nothing to prevent any of this from occurring or stopping it from occurring. So this is a chapter that might give you guys some triggers if you guys have been essayed or been through that in your life be prepared. If you don't want to listen to this, you can catch me on next week when we talk about chapter four, when she met Danny Keo. Okay. So I understand there could be triggers with this. I myself had a few when I read this tra chapter myself, but because I am grown and found help in my situation, I am just giving you guys a heads up that there is certain things in this book, you guys, and this is one of those chapters. So just be prepared, okay? Lisa says that when she was 10 years old, her mom sent her to a couple of different schools in Los Angeles. One of those schools was in Carver City. She said they had a housekeeper back then. She was a wonderful black lady named Ruby. She would take her to school to school and she would play gospel music on the radio which was all she ever wanted to hear at that time because her father would listen to gospel too so lisa was totally into gospel she wanted to hear it she craved hearing it it seems to me that priscilla put her in the wrong religion man she needed gospel in her life she sh should have Put her in a Christian church. She would have got all the gospel she wanted and then some, but that was not the case with Lisa. So I digress. She said that the schools that she was in were super casual. There was no uniforms and, and, and there, it seemed to be ref refreshing for her. She said, you can learn at your own pace. She said that you didn't have to be anyone special there either, and she felt no pressure at all. She didn't do very well in groups, work-wise, school-wise, anything-wise. She was an individual, and she was already thinking anarchy as a child. <laughs> she said over the next few years, she started to develop a really bad attitude, and she was getting heavily into drugs. They kicked her out of the Carver School. Scientology didn't want her fully kicked out, so they sent her to the Apple Valley Scientology School in Los Feliz. They failed at everything. 
and she also failed too, every single time. Lisa said that she wasn't trying to be bad. She just seriously did not give a crap. She wore black, dyed her hair black. She had a problem with authority. It would always be F you, F your authority, F the system, F the teachers, F the parent attitude. It was around this time when Lisa discovered the album Pink Floyd, The Wall. We don't need no education. We don't need no self-control. No dark sarcasms in the classroom. Teacher, leave them kids alone. <laughs> All you are is just a, another brick in the wall. Sorry to sing it for you guys. I wanted to play it, but you know how copyright is. So that's the song. She would play it over and over again. She said it was like a Bible to her. Probably one of the songs that could be put in her autobiography. Anyways, her mom couldn't control her. She had no interest in being a good kid. So one Friday, her mom picked her up from school and she said, Pack your clothes. You're going to school in OG. Lisa knew by then that she'd been thinking of. Lisa knew by then that her mother has been thinking about packing her up and taking her to boarding school. She said it would be somewhere in Switzerland or Kabbalt's in Israel. It's a long way from home. She found her applications laying around the house one day, and she knew what her mother was up to. She said that she felt like her mother was always actively trying to figure out how to send her away, here, there, and everywhere. Just you. You take her. Take her. Just get her away from me. I don't want her near me. She just had that feeling. She did. She had mostly just dumped Lisa off into Scientology because Chrissy thought they could handle her. Scientology kind of raised Lisa. But Priscilla would always try to get her into a boarding school. And Lisa wouldn't have it. She always messed up with the admission test and they wouldn't take her. So by now, she was on her way to be a boarder at the Happy Valley School in Ojai, and she was scared. The school was clearly designed for parents who wanted to just send their kids away. So these are sent Scientology parents that didn't want their kids around, so they would just send them away to this Happy Valley School. Now, with as much research as I have done on Happy Valley, there was nothing happy about Happy Valley Scientology School for Children. They didn't give them school curriculum. No, they did um, exercises in that school. And I'm not talking about jumping jacks and push-ups or any of that. I'm talking about mental exercises that they had to go into as a young children. They would have to narc each other out, meaning you were allowed to tell on another student. You were encouraged to tell on other students. You were encouraged to sit in a group of st students, stare at each other, and who would ever crack first you were allowed to be able to make that person crack. It's all mental stuff that they had to do, and it's very sad. So if you guys are interested on the Happy Valley School and history of that school, it is on Google. You can Google it. You can also YouTube it as well. And there was a documentary about it as well not very long ago, and it's actually pretty sad what these kids have to, had to go through. So I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, anyways, by now, she was at Happy Valley School, and she was scared. And um, the first thing that Lisa did when she arrived was look, look for who had weed. She wanted to find pot, so she looked, and she probably found it because Lisa was already into drugs by then. So I guess we can say by 12 years old, it was like a Drew Barrymore situation. By 12 years old, Lisa was already dabbling in drugs. We're, think, we're talking weed and um, cocaine by this time. It's crazy to think about, guys. But here's our girl hurting, and she's a child, and she doesn't understand what happened, and she can't lash out. She can't do anything. She's a child. So 
She wasn't put in counseling because Scientology didn't believe in counseling. She wasn't on medication to help her depression because they didn't believe in that. She wasn't in anything that could help her evaluate, elevate her up to where she needed to be. She was in all the Scientology stuff. So I'm just saying, to me, no wonder she she turned to drugs because there was nobody else trying to help this poor girl. Nobody. Anyway. They were out in the middle of nowhere with nothing to do at this Happy Valley school. She also would stay with her mom at Montecito on the weekends, which was just an hour away, unless she got in trouble, which meant Lisa would not be able to go home to visit. And she kept getting in trouble, so her probation kept getting extended, meaning she didn't get to go home very much, but she probably didn't want to go home to see her mom very much anyway. That's probably why she kept getting in trouble. <laughs> Think about it. If your home life is chaotic and your mother is not helping you and it seems like one thing after another and you're in this place and this place is it for you, I guess you would get in trouble to stay in this place so you wouldn't have to go home. So you wouldn't have to deal with your mother. Obvious in this book, she didn't want to deal with her mother. And her mother, which wasn't much of a mother at all at this time, did not want to deal with Lisa. So that's what I'm getting out of this book. Lisa said that sometimes at this school there would be a drug bust and they would be investigating who was involved. And it was always clearly Lisa. That's so sad to think about. She's not even 12 yet. Wow. She said she was always falling behind in her studies, and she was terrible at math since birth. She had no interest in being a good kid either. As Lisa said, I just seriously did not give an F. So she didn't give an F about anything at this time. She started to cycle through different phases. She was a hippie chick at one point, at OJ, kind of punk rock, and then funk rock kid. All Lisa wanted to do was drugs, weed, and coke mo mostly. So those were her two go-to drugs, was pot and cocaine. She wasn't addicted to anything particular. She liked it all. She wanted to get her hands on the, anything that she could, that she could swallow, snort, eat, sniff, you name it. She was looking for it. She never ran into her heroin, though. Never was in the same room with it. Thank God, Lisa said. That would happen later. The main purpose in life was just to find a score. As soon as it settled into heavy metal phase, Lisa dyed her hair all black, and then she bleached it and did drugs. But Happy Valley didn't want to throw Lisa out just yet because they knew her home life wasn't so great. So that's saying something. Scientology knew that her own home life was not very great. So they kept her there because her home life wasn't that great. So they let her get away with this stuff. Every once in a while, Apple School would take a group of kids uh, every summer to Spain where they had a house. And even though Lisa was no longer at that school, her mom made her go. They would go and they would take care of the house. They would garden and farm and then have fun at night by hanging out on the beach and partying. Somehow, Lisa made it through the first year of OJ. By this point in Lisa's life, her mother's role was just to be a chronic stop sign. She didn't try to talk to her, hang out with her, be a friend with her. She was very much in love with her father's side of the family which is like Patsy. They were wildly colorful people, she said, and she could relate to them. I wish they could have hung out with Joe and Billy Smith because that side of the family would have been great for them too, you know, but that's not how it happened. We don't know completely why Priscilla wouldn't let Lisa see Billy and Joe Smith and Danny and Joey. We don't know what what went down, what what went wrong, but what we do know is she didn't talk to them again after Billy Smith worked at Graceland in the early 80s. Never happened. 
but I always wish that maybe she could have got in touch with them over the years, but she didn't. I hope she didn't listen to somebody's lies to keep her away from Billy and Joe Smith, but we just We just don't know what really occurred in her household or her mind, why her mother would not let her see Billy. Lisa said that she knows that her mother tried her best, but she never yelled at her mother. She never badmouthed her mother. She never mouthed off at her mother or cursed at her. She was never violent around her, anything like that. But she was despondent, extremely melancholy, moody, dark. I'm sure she had no idea what to do with that, Lisa said. When she got back from Spain, there was a wild girl. And she had been waiting for her when she arrived. And she'd been hearing all about her. She seemed cool and interesting. But at the time, she had a thing with this German kid. And she had sex with him. And this guy was somebody that Lisa had a crush on. And she thought, I'm done being up here. So she pretended to be all strung out on drugs. So her mom would take her to another school. She said, Mom, if I stay up here, I'm going to die. Sure enough, Priscilla took her out of Happy Valley. By now, her mom was dating a guy named Michael Edwards. They dated for about six years. Edward was an actor and model. He was a dramatic guy, a horrible, with a horrible temper. He was often on drugs, too. He and Priscilla would fight constantly, and it was physical. Lisa could hear her mother screaming. They would party a lot, go to discos, and was on cocaine because there was always cocaine around she said when they'd come home at night from partying it was so destabilizing she said she could hear furniture flying and her mother screaming because they were having fights she said in a crazy turn of events michael edwards got a part in the movie mommy dearest one day he was still making the movie and Lisa's mom came into her room, went through her closet, and was yelling at Lisa because she had wire hangers in her closet. Why are you using these? These come from the cleaners. These need to be exchanged for the nice ones, the plastic ones. And she was yelling. You could hear laughter from down the hallway. The irony, Michael shouted down the hallway. This is too crazy that you're actually yelling at your daughter about wire hangers and I'm in the movie Mommy Dearest. Lisa's mom realized that it was crazy and she started laughing too. And Lisa thought, this is my life now? You're both effing crazy. Both of them were losing their mind in her head. She's like, why am I getting yelled over daggum hangers? I mean, if Priscilla would come and look at my closet, she would be aghast that I have all kinds of different hangers in my closet. (laughs) Just the fact that she was focusing on hangers, man. Maybe her and Joan Crawford had something, had some similarities, you know? They both cared about themselves because in the end, Joan Crawford didn't care about any of her children. I'm just remembering the book that Joan Crawford's daughter wrote, Mommy Dearest, and the movie as well. Anyways, I digress. Lisa said that her mom was going to put her back in Apple Valley School, and she was far behind in her studies, so they told her that she'll need daily tutoring, and she'll have to stay at her mom's house with Michael Edwards. She didn't want to be there either. She didn't want to be anywhere. The only place in her head that she could think about She probably just wanted her dad. Mm -mm -mm. She was constantly pulling attitude, blasting heavy metal on her record player all day. She writes here that one night her mom made dinner, and when she cut into the chicken, it wasn't cooked. So Lisa said that it wasn't cooked. 
The next thing that Lisa knew, Edwards flipped his plate so that it flew across the room and smashed into the wall. Lisa threw up her hands like to say, what the what? And at that, he jumped up, started screaming gibberish and ran out the room. When he got back, he was holding the end of the cord that attached to Lisa's record player. He had cut it with the scissors. He was still yelling. Your mother cooks and you just blast your effing rock and roll, your effing music, your rock and roll music. He was making no sense to Lisa. Eventually, he yelled at her to get out. Lisa was in shock, so she left the kitchen. But while she left, she could hear that they were starting to talk about her and trying to figure out what to do with her. Lisa at that time went looking for some cocaine in the house that she had hidden somewhere and she couldn't remember where she hid it. Wow, she was probably 12, 12 years old, 12, 13 years old. <laughs> it's hard to think about. Um, I will say one thing, Priscilla shouldn't be cooking any meal because we know she's not a cook. We know an Elvis and me. She made lasagna for Elvis and the boys and she forgot the very most important thing of lasagna. She forgot to cook the noodles. So, yeah, I don't think she should have been cooking for her family. Seems like she's still bad even when Lisa was about 12. To not cook chicken correctly, you can get salmonella and get, get real sick from that. So I think uh, she should have left it to the chefs that she hired to take care of Lisa to cook dinner at night, too, because she couldn't handle it. I'm just saying, even Priscilla said herself she wasn't much of a good cook, you know. So. so, she's talking about now the first time that Edwards ever came into her room in the middle of the night, drunk, kneeling, was years before. She said, I think I was 10. And I'm going to read what she says completely because... It's just hard to improvise, so I'm just going to read you what she says, guys. I woke up to find him on his knees next to my bed, running his finger up my leg under the sheets. And if I moved, he stopped. So I moved. I was awake, but I was trying to be asleep. He said he was going to teach me what it was going to happen when I get older. He was putting his hand on my chest and saying, a man's going to touch me here. Then he put his hand between my leg and he said, they're going to touch you here. I think he gently kissed me and then he left for the night. I told my mom in the car the next day and I watched her slam the foot down on the gas. At home, I ran into my room and she flew into her room and slammed the door. Eventually, she called me in and said that Edwards wanted to apologize. He said, I'm so sorry, but in Europe, that's how the kids, that's how they teach the kids. So that's what I was doing. I didn't know what to say. I would always feel bad for him when he apologized. And to me, he apologized way too much. And Priscilla kept letting him stay there way too long. Eventually, it became that he would touch me and spank me, telling me not to look. Don't look at me, he'd say. Don't turn your head. I assume he was masturbating is what she thinks he was doing while he was spanking her. She said he wouldn't be mad at me. He just spanked me. He did it very calmly, just sitting in a chair, spanking my butt. My butt would be black, blue, orange, and green. It was kind of the same drill every time. He'd come in my room, do what he did. Once I showed my mom my butt, and she said, Well, what did you do to cause that? As if he had just given me a spanking for misbehavior. And then she'd go scream at him, and he'd say, Oh, I was drunk, or one excuse after another, or she was actually flirting with me. And then she would make him come in and apologize. I would feel bad and forgive him. I was 11, 12 and 13. He'd still come into my room now and then, but I would move and do something to make him think that I was awake. Then he'd run down the hallway back to my mom's room and freak out and stay away. I'm glad she did that 
because that would that at least got him out of her room back to his girlfriend's room, her mom, and he would stay away. She said at this point in her life, her mom was trying to have a career. She wanted to be a model and then an actress. She was always out of town. And the one person home that would watch her would be Michael Edwards. She said she would actually see Michael more than she did her own mother. Every Christmas, her mom would give amazing gifts, but he didn't have much money. Michael didn't. So it would be a pity party for Michael every year because he couldn't afford anything. She said Michael had a terrible temper. One morning, he made some comment about how I needed to get her under her underwear off the dryer or something. Lisa said that she said something nasty back like, it's not like you're not enjoying that under my breath. So I was walking out the room. Michael then took a dining room chair and launched it at her, hit her in the back. It didn't hit her that hard, but it got her enough to scare the crap out of her. And she was crying the whole way to school. She said there was a lot of violence in this house. You could hear her mom scream and cry, and he'd be throwing stuff. Lisa said she wanted to protect her mom, but she didn't know how. She said that it got really bad when he went on a modeling job trip in the Virgin Islands, and her mom and her went with him. Priscilla suspected that Michael was having an affair with one of the models, so she told Lisa to help catch him. At one point, Priscilla went into Michael's room and she could hear them going at each other. Lisa went in there and saw him grab her and throw her on the bed. Lisa was launched across the room and she jumped on his back and he threw her on the bed too. Priscilla screamed, let's go, let's go. We set off running down the hall and they reached the elevator and they hit the button to go. But when they, they turned around, they could see he was frantically chasing them like someone out of a horror movie. He somehow made it back to his room and they made it back to theirs. And he calls Priscilla up and he acts like a puppy dog again, begging her to come back to him. And um, Priscilla always went back to Michael. And it made Lisa angry that Priscilla always went back to Michael after all of these incidences. The next day, Lisa said she had to go to Memphis, but she was an effing wreck. Now we're going to when she was 14 years old. Her first boyfriend was a kid who went to school with her. They dated for a year and they did everything but have sex. He was a good kid, but he had a terrible temper. Her mom was doing an active job, acting job on a movie with Michael Landon in the Bahamas. She went with her. There she met a 23-year-old guy who had a part in the movie. She didn't meet him until the day before that they left, and she fell for him hard. They walked on the beach, talked the whole time, and he was really cute, according to Lisa. She said that she was there while he packed his bags and they were really sad then he kissed her and they left the island lisa remembers listening to the song torn between two lovers on the plane ride home thinking that she had a boyfriend back home but she was thinking about this guy in the bahamas so when she finally made it to la she broke up with her boyfriend that she was dating for a year she said that she used to call the 23-year-old guy just to be silent, so he got used to the silent caller. He said She said that she would call, and there was no caller ID back then or anything like it is today. The first time she'd call, there'd be no nothing there. It, she'd be silent, and he'd go, hello? Who is this? Hello? Annoyed. Next time I called, and he said, it's you again. Then Lisa was punching the numbers to answer yes or no to his questions. Have we met? Beep. Do we know each other? Bop. Then he figured it out. I was so nerve-wracked. The guy was understandably horribly oppre apprehensive about seeing me. Well, yeah, he's 23 and you're 14. That's illegal. Of course he's apprehensive, right, guys? 
but she wanted to actually meet up with him. So one day she told the teachers that she was going to the dentist and she had this guy pick her up about a block or two blocks away from her school. They walked all day in Beverly Hills. She didn't care where they were. She was just glad they were together. She said she just wanted to be with him. She said that he gave her his ring at the end of it and then he dropped her off right before she was due back at school. She was really, really gone about this guy. She said her mom found out and she was grounded and banned from speaking to him or contacting him, which of course didn't work. But she was not going to be stopped from seeing him. She was completely madly in love with him. After that, there was a lot of sneaking around with him. At some point, Priscilla said, I could see him, but we weren't supposed to be alone. We were to have someone like mom to be about and could see what we were doing. I could invite him to go somewhere that my mom was also going to be. And he also became friends with Michael Edwards, of course. He was a 23-year-old being chaperoned by someone's mom. But it was also history repeating itself. Lisa says this. My mom was 14 when she met my dad. I was replaying her life in a weird way. But she and my dad waited until she was 18 to have sex. I was 14 when I lost my virginity to this guy. Wow, a lot to comprehend here. So, okay. So she says that her mom was 18 years old when she finally had sex with Elvis. Uh, she's been giving us that she was 22 on their wedding night all this time. Remember, guys, the story she shoved down our throats with Elvis and me? Oh, we waited, we waited, we waited till our wedding night. Oh, we waited. Well, Lisa said that um, her mother was 18. So it goes to show, Priscilla lies. She lies like the wind blows, folks. I believe Lisa over Priscilla any day. But poor Lisa lost her virginity at 14 to a guy who was 23. Mm -mm -mm. She said after that, all she wanted to do was have sexual relations with this guy. She would make out with him. She would go behind her mom's back. They would meet somewhere. She also says this guy was a total womanizer. He was a complete and utter player. He had other girls on the side that Lisa didn't even know about. Even more and more women were in love with him. It was crazy. She said that Priscilla knew a woman at the time who was a playboy bunny. But when I started dating this guy, the playboy bunny was already having an affair with him. And my mom told me that this woman was trying to get my mother to send me off to that kibbutz in Israel school to get me out of the way. I was with him for two and a half years. The ending was a nightmare. See, that part don't make sense to me. I think that Lisa believed her mother too much. I think a lot of this was probably stories that Priscilla told Lisa so Lisa would have dumped this guy. What do you guys think in the comment section below? Do you believe Priscilla or do you believe me? Because <laughs> I really think that her mother didn't like anybody she was with. The only person that she liked that she was ever with is, is, is Michael Asshat Lockwood, right? So to me, this could be just a story to make Lisa dump this guy. But she didn't. She was with him a little longer after that. But anyways, the ending was a nightmare, she said. She said that he took her to a park and had a friend secretly, secretly take pictures of them. He got paid for the photos. He didn't care about her. It was just an opportunity for him. But their relationship was illegal and selling those photos out, outed him. But the media at that time didn't care that I was underage. You would think the media would have cared about that, folks. A lot of people failed Lisa. A lot of people failed Lisa. Anyways, she says that she wanted revenge. She says that her mother said that she was going to make a plan, that she was going to arrange for off-duty cops to bust him for selling cocaine. Now, here's another story that I really don't believe Priscilla doing either.
just because we know her personality. I just think that when Lisa was was young, she took whatever her mother told her at face value, not thinking her mother lies. I think when she got older, she realized her mother lies, you know, but I appreciate her telling us this story. But she said when she found out about all this, she took about 20 Valium to try to do a suicide attempt. But she went to the hospital and they made it, they gave her some medicine to make her throw it up. And that was the end of that. It was her first big love and first big betrayal. But she wasn't really that serious about the suicide attempt. She took the 20 Valium in the presence of someone else. But guys, I feel so sorry for this girl. It's just so heartbreaking, every little thing that she went through. And to think that she trusted her mother. I think a lot of these stories her mother made up make her feel insecure and less loved. I just do. Here she goes again. She went back to school. She didn't understand why she was there in the first place. No one ever told her why I was ever in school. No one ever asked her, what would you like to be when you grow up? Actually, everyone who saw her after she was nine, after her dad died, always said that she looked so sad. They always said she looked so sad. Every picture we have of her, there's a sadness behind her eyes, folks. You can see it in every picture she ever made. There's a sadness there. Even with a smile on her face, behind her eyes, there's a sadness, and you can see that. She said that her mom made her live with her again, but again, she was miserable. She was a terror. It was clear she didn't want to be there and her mother didn't want her there either. Her mother tried to make her go to other boarding schools, but it never worked out. So in the middle of the night, she made Lisa pack her bags and took her to the Scientology Celebrity Center and dropped her off there. The woman who ran the place took her to a tiny room on the third floor. She was just glad to be out of her mother's roof by that time. She didn't care where she was at. But when she got up the first morning, she removed the large mirror from the wall and she called her Coke dealer and invited him and about seven to six of her friends to come over. They proceeded to have a four day bender in that room. Where are the adults checking in on her? She had a four day cocaine bender in her room at a celebrity center where there's adults where she's dropped off and they don't check in on her. They don't know what she's doing in her room with all these people. She's an underage child, for Christ's sake. And she's doing these drugs under the roof of this celebrity center. Where are the adults here? She said she woke up at one point and everyone was asleep. And she had a moment where she was just done. And she yelled, everyone wake up. Get the F out of here. Get out. It took all the rest of her cocaine and she flushed it down the toilet. She went down to where they audit people and she was shaking, sweating, and crying. And she said, help me, help me. So they moved her to a really nice room on the sixth floor. It was a luxury palace with a kitchen and a dining room and everything. They made her promise to behave herself and study and create and actually do stuff. For some reason, it worked. For the next few months, Lisa actually started to do really well. Then her mother tried to make her move back to her house. And that's when DEFCON 3 started. It was Christmas. They had to go with Michael Edwards to Pensacola, Florida, where his daughter Caroline lived. She and Lisa were supposed to stay home, and they pretended that they had, but they actually went out. She said that they didn't do drugs and or anything, but it was the point that they had lied. Lisa said, my mom and Edward showed up at her house. I saw my mother get out of the car, and I took off running down the street with my mother chasing me. I'm flying. My mom is screaming at me, but she can't catch me. In the end, I got in her car. She's in the front seat. I'm in the back. 
and she's screaming at me because I'm dodging her attempts to hit me. Edwards was trying to get her off of me. I'm punching myself in the face, trying to make it look really dramatic so it would seem like she did it. Mm. And this is the incident where the police were called and they come and that's when Lisa says, oh, okay, officer, nothing happened. And that's when Priscilla also said, okay, officer, nothing happened. It was just a little spat between mother and daughter. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along, move along. So I know that because it's in Michael Edwards' book. The only difference between this account and Michael Edwards' account is Michael Edwards' account is Priscilla is actually really hitting Lisa. But in this book, Lisa is saying she's hitting herself to make it look like Priscilla is hitting her. So the next day they flew back to Los Angeles. She said that Priscilla wouldn't let her out of her sight. And during the layover, she was trying desperately to call the celebrity center for help, but her mom wouldn't even let her go to the bathroom without her. She said back in L.A., her mom was walking her through the lobby to the celebrity center to go get some of Lisa's things from her room. She felt like somebody had a gun to her back. As they walked, she looked at some guy that she kind of knew. And in her eyes, she tried to mouth, help me. Wow. Her mom got her home that night and heavy negotiations started the next day. She agreed to let Lisa go back to the Celebrity Center, but she would have to go to their Narconon office and enter their rehab. Give me a minute, Lisa said. She went and called the father of a friend of hers and asked him what to do. He told her to ask for 24 hours to think about it. So Lisa told the rehab that she seemed to have three options. Live with her mom and Edward, go to Narconon, or hit the streets. So Lisa told them she chose the third option, the streets. I'd rather live on the streets than be here with you. This is how a teenager of her understanding would have been by that time. She'd rather live on the streets than to be anywhere near her mother or rehab. Hold on, hold on, they said, trying to negotiate. You can go back to your room. You can have freedom at the Celebrity Center. And that you can do whatever, reading, studying. But all, but all Lisa was caring about was living at the Celebrity Center in her own room without being with her mother. And they eventually agreed. So Lisa went. And soon enough, Lisa was passed out drunk in front of her room. Then they actually came up with a great idea. They made Lisa take care of somebody who came in addicted to drugs. They gave her a car so she could drive this woman around and take care of her and help her with life. Lisa became really close with that girl, really took her under her wing. Lisa says that this girl was a young mom addicted to heroin. Her husband and kids didn't even know. Lisa really thrived taking care of her, helping somebody else. So now Lisa essentially had her own apartment in the Celebrity Center and made a lot of friends there. Occasionally, she would hook up with that older guy who sold photos of her. And he was living with a woman at that time. But one afternoon, Lisa met up with him at his place, and they had sex when she was gone. Then she said, the guy wanted to meet up with her more and wanted to have more of a relationship with Lisa. But by that point, Lisa had met and fallen in love with a guy named Danny Keogh. And that's what we're going to focus on next week, guys, on Chapter 4. There's a bluebird in my heart. I hope you guys um, enjoyed this segment. I find it refreshing to hear that Lisa didn't hold back on everything that happened to her. That Lisa didn't even hold back on her drug addiction. 
and how young that she was when she started doing these drugs. 11, 12, 13. Seriously, that's, that's a very young age. But if you guys read the story about Drew Barrymore, about the same kind of life. Yep. Guys, it's always very emotional when we read how much Lisa was hurt. I think a lot of people failed Lisa Marie. And we're going to get into it even more in this book, how many people failed her. But in this chapter alone, her own mother, in my opinion, failed Lisa Marie. Her own mother failed her in this chapter. And that's my personal opinion. Also, guys, I'm going to give away two of these books at the end of this segment. After we do all nine chapters, you guys will have a chance to win one of these copies of the, of the book from here to the great unknown. So I thought I'd let you know we're going to give away two of these to one of you guys at the end of, of the segment. Okay, guys? All right. I'm going to let you guys go. Just know that I love each and every one of you guys. You could have been to any Elvis channel, but you didn't. You want to hear your Lisa book from me. And for that, I love you guys for it. Um, it's just a lot to go over. It makes me sad just to think that that was her life and she had to go through that. It really does. And there's more of the stuff that's going to happen in her life. And it wasn't sunshine and roses in Lisa's life. And I'm very proud that Riley didn't hold back and gave us as much as possible that we can understand Lisa Marie more than we did before. That's about it, guys. But anyways, I'll see you guys next week with part three. It'll be Tuesday, okay? All right, guys. TCB, TLC. God bless you all. And you know what? I'll see you on the other side, okay, guys? Bye, everybody. Be safe out there, okay?